My name is Stephen, and I'm from Toronto. Hi, I'm Nilafar, and I'm from Montreal. My name is Laura, and I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. I'm Ethan, and I'm from Richmond Hill, Ontario. It's just days until the 2021 federal election. I don't know who to vote for. I am undecided. I have questions. I need answers. I care about climate change. It's time to act. I care about affordability. I care about the vaccine passports. I care about Canadians with disabilities and Indigenous matters. I vote because it's my duty as a citizen. My vote matters. This is my time. It's my turn. It's my turn. Hello and welcome again to Face to Face with the Federal Leaders. I'm Rosemary Barton here in the National Studio in Toronto. As you may know, all this week we've booked time with each of the leaders of the major national federal parties and then we take that time and hand it over to you, the voters, to ask them questions. We've got our virtual audience watching live from home commenting as we go, because of course we can't have people in the studio. And we've invited four undecided voters to have some one-on-one -on -one time with each of the leaders to ask anything they like, and then I, as I do, jump into the conversation too. Tonight is all about trying to get answers for you, the voters, and for these voters specifically. And tonight, we've got the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, in the hot seat. Welcome, thanks for doing this. Thanks for making the time to do it. Yeah, happy to be here, looking forward to it. Uh, let's, we'll be transparent, as I've said with the other leaders, we did give you the names, first names of the people um, their hometowns, general topics, just mm -hmm. so you wouldn't be completely caught off guard. But that's all you know. That's all you know. <laughs> so uh, we wanted to get right to it. We asked each of our participants to send us a quick intro that they shot themselves. Let's meet our first voter. Yeah. My name is Nella Fair Al Shabaji. I run a restaurant in the heart of downtown Montreal. Restaurant Nella Fair is a definition of a family restaurant. Even my son, who is not even two years old, and my amazing husband are always there to come in and help out. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter. My voice matters. COVID had a real negative impact on my business, and I'm wondering what are we gonna do to make sure my friends, my family, and my clients are safe? Okay, wow. Nilufar, good introduction. Uh, over to you with Mr. Singh. You've got your five minutes now. Hi, Mr. Singh. Hi it's there. a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Um, Hi. So um, I'm a business owner. Mm -hmm. I'm also an undecided voter. Mm -hmm. um, the last 18 months with COVID have obviously had like a horrific, imp horrific impact on my business. Mm -hmm. Now the streets are becoming lively again. People are coming back and I'm happy. I'm excited. It seems to be going back to normal. But then all of a sudden I'm thrown up a roadblock with the vaccination passports. So I'm stuck having to police who comes in and out of the restaurants. In some cases, I'm having to refuse these customers that I've been waiting 18 months for. Mm. So I know that you want to have a national COVID-19 passport, and Prime Minister Trudeau wants to give money to provinces to have their own, but is there no other solution? Is there no other option? What strategy do you have that would keep my family safe, my friends safe, Canadians safe, mm while also not putting such a huge burden on business owners, which we've already had this whole time. Mm. What would you do different? Or is it more of the same same things with just different party leaders? What would you do? Okay. Uh, first of all, I, it's, it's amazing. I saw, your, I saw the sign, Nulifer. You must be so proud to see your name every time you walk into your, your restaurant. That's amazing. And I saw I the kids, uh, your kid, you. your child and, and your partner. Um, we want to support small businesses. I get Congratulations. You. I know you're having one too. Yes, we are. We are. I know that it's been tough though on small yeah. businesses. It's been, a, it's been a tough time. So we want to make it easier. And what I noticed, I was traveling into the Atlantic provinces and they needed proof of vaccination. And my team was coming from Ottawa and we didn't have that proof easy. So we had to scramble and find the old emails and show that our, we had proof of vaccination. So what we want to do is make it easy by having a document that people could use to quickly prove that they are uh, vaccinated. So if someone's coming to visit your restaurant from another city or another province, they don't have to pull up an email and try to show you something on their phone. They'll have an easy to use document that can show, hey, I'm vaccinated. Uh, I, I can come into your restaurant. So I, I want to make it easier. That's my plan. So if I have a lineup of like 25 people, do I have to hire somebody else to check proofs of vaccination? Am I gonna have to lose even more money by hiring somebody to check or do I have to do it myself? And where's the freedom in this? Where's the anonymity? Where do we draw the line with the COVID-19 passports? 
So a uh, really good question. The decisions to require people to have a proof of vaccination is a provincial decision. They're the ones that decide that. I just want to make it easier. If you've got a guest coming in from another province, I love visiting Montreal. It's an amazing place. If I wanted to come in and I was coming from Ottawa or coming from Toronto and I didn't have any proof of vaccination, I don't want that person to have a barrier to getting into your store. So I want a federal document that's easy to use that could be easily shown, hey, I'm vaccinated and they can walk in. Uh, in terms of the enforcement, I feel like it's really a high burden to put on small businesses, that you're the ones that have to police this. I get that that's a, a struggle. I'm not sure how uh, that should be alleviated, but I get that that's a tough, that's a tough burden for small businesses. Neil Farshall, I have a go, and then we'll... Would you... And then we'll come back and see if you've got anything else. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so as Neil Lafar, she's very well briefed, and those were great questions, said you, you want some sort of national uh, vaccine passport. But as you know, most provinces already have put in place a passport. Uh, I think we're down to maybe two that don't have them now, Alberta and Saskatchewan. So is it too late to do this? Is it too late to institute a national vaccine passport? It should have been done earlier, I think. It would have made life easier. Like I was mentioning my own experience going into the Atlanta yeah. provinces. It was complicated. It would have been a lot easier. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's that option available. Uh, we're going to probably need something to travel. It looks like the world's headed in that direction. If there's going to be a document for international travel, why not also make it available for domestic travel? Yeah, except it was my understanding that when these conversations started, no province wanted a national passport, and the provinces, as you know, hold the data. So I, I, I'm not sure what the national passport, how, how that would even work. Well, the same way that there was going to be a national, you know, Mr. Trudeau mentioned having a national uh, tra passport to travel internationally. If the federal government could have one for international travel, mm. for provinces that don't have it, so there's still two provinces that don't have it, and those folks want to travel within Canada, right now they're going to have to do what I did, which is pull up their email, show that they got proof, sign out right. some documents. Instead, if we had something that was easy to use, really the goal here is I don't want to make it hard for someone who's been vaccinated to prove it. Yeah, it, it just seems like maybe this whole conversation is coming too late, given that provinces have it. And, and the Liberals' proposal, as you probably know, is to give the provinces a billion dollars and say, here, at least we'll help you run yours. Is, is that part of what you're also offering? There's nothing wrong with that. I think the idea of helping provinces makes sense. I just think that it would have been a lot easier if we had one right away, federally. There was some talk about having one for travel. And I yeah. thought, well, if we're going to have one for travel, why not make it so it's accessible for international or for local domestic travel? Um, on, on the people out there who are vaccine hesitant or people who don't believe in the vaccine. And, mm -hmm. and we know that there, there's different groups within that category. Mm -hmm. But we've seen some of them very present, particularly uh, at, at Mr. Trudeau's events. How do you convince those people, those other people, that they do have to go and get vaccinated? Do you believe it should be required uh, for them to live their lives f to go and get vaccinated? Uh, I think it's really important to get vaccinated. And I think there's a lot of people that are harder to vaccinate, but not opposed to it completely. And those are folks that may have barriers to getting vaccinated because they don't have access to the right type of internet or they aren't able to get onto the website to book an appointment. So there's those folks and I think we've got to help them out. And there's some folks that might have some questions. And the way we do with that is more transparency, letting folks know the same medical professionals that you'd go to if your loved one was ill or if you were ill, yeah. they're the ones that are saying, please get vaccinated. But, but you would also recognize there are people that aren't going to be convinced. And what do you do with those people? Well, people have the choice uh, at the end of the day not to, but there are going to be places where you're going to need to go, that you need proof. We know that for healthcare workers or frontline workers that have contact with people, there's a risk that that poses. Yep. So there'll be ca cases where people have to get vaccinated. And obviously at the end of the day, no one's going to, you can't force a person to get vaccinated. That's not, that's not constitutional. It's not fair. It's not morally right to force someone physically. And, and there will be barriers though, because we want to keep people safe and keeping people safe means we've got to do things. Nilufar, I think you have another question. Do you? Last one. Yeah, always, always. <laughs> yes. Um, More so questions. we're talking about giving. Yeah, we're talking about giving money to provinces, giving money to provinces. But I'm talking about the actual business owners. Are we going to get money to hire mm. somebody to stand at the door, or are we going to get some sort of compensation for the customers that I do have to refuse? How's it going to work, mm. and how are we going to make it more fair for the actual business owners, and while keeping everything safe? Like, what would your strategy be? Gotcha. Um, so I know you're looking specifically for help around that that whether people have the vaccine passport or not. 
Uh, what we're proposing is a way to support small businesses that could answer that problem as well. We think that the big box stores, the large corporations did really well in this pandemic, but stores like yours, uh, smaller businesses, local community businesses suffered a lot. So our plan is to continue the weight subsidy, to continue the rental subsidy, to continue support specifically for small businesses and make sure that those large big box stores pay their fair share so that we can continue to provide businesses like yours with the support. And amongst that support would be a way for you to be able to offset some of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome back to Face to Face. We invited undecided voters to have one-on-one -on -one time with the federal leaders. Jagmeet Singh joins us tonight. Let's meet the next questioner. Hello, my name is Stephen Douglas. I work in Northern Ontario in Sandy Lake First Nation. I am a registered psychotherapist, uh, so I work in mental health. So the most alarming and immediate concern I have approaching this vote is, is climate change. We have delayed and obfuscated and accommodated our carbon addiction for dangerously far too long. Okay, Stephen, it's over to you. Your time with Mr. Singh starts now. Hi there. Oh, thank you, Rosemary. Uh, hello, Mr. Singh. It's a, it's a pleasure meeting you, and I feel very honored to have this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you just heard, I'm, I'm working in, in Northern Ontario. Um, and we're seeing uh, communities, uh, remote communities in the north are seeing already suffering from an increase in severe forest fires. Uh, communities across the north in Canada are seeing an increase in the frequency of severe fire seasons. So both in terms of uh, the number of days of fire and the, the area, the burn area. Um, as a consequence, a lot of communities are in evacuation. They're on evacuation alert uh, year after year. So for the sake of all who will be devastated by fires or flooding, drought, uh, risk and harm to wildlife, um, I want to see action on climate change now. We've been speaking of it for quite some time, but we simply don't have any more time to waste. Um, so my question is, what infrastructure commitments can the NDP offer uh, or make that will utilize Canada's natural assets, spur innovation? Um, what are the nuts and bolts of an NDP plan that will help Canada transition into a, a renewable energy economy? I really appreciate your question, and I appreciate it particularly given that you're, you're living in, in the north or you're spending time now in the north in a community, Sandy Lake, that is uh, one of the communities that, that's disproportionately impacted. We've seen northern communities in Ontario, particularly indigenous communities that are more disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis. And we know that that's the case, that there is a different experience when it comes to the climate crisis for those that are in more remote and more rural. Uh, in northern communities, they're hitting, they're being harder hit. So I, I appreciate the question in that context. Um, our approach is, is very different from, from the liberal and the conservative approach where they believe that it's just about putting a price on pollution. We believe we need to mobilize resources. I believe very strongly that if we have an all-of-government approach, where we use the resources we have to invest in the type of economy that is sustainable, that's the way we need to go. So some of the concrete proposals we have, we want to electrify transportation and invest heavily in the reduction of our emissions that comes from transportation. We want to invest uh, in retrofitting buildings and homes, as they're one of the largest greenhouse gas emitters. We want to retrofit those buildings. We also want to invest in renewable energy. We know that people don't think of Canada when they think of renewable energy, but I don't think that has to be the way. We know that a lot of the abandoned oil wells could be remediated into geothermal energy. We know that we still have a very viable a solar, wind, and tidal energy opportunities that haven't been really invested in. That's what I want to do. Hmm. Thank you. Um, you're touching upon some of the key points that I was hoping you would. Has the NDP developed or, had, do you, or can you share anything a bit more specific? You know, what makes that plan uh, specifically more um, uh, immediately effective? Uh, this is where I'm trying, you know, as an as a undecided voter, I need to make sure that uh, my vote will help bring about change immediately. So. Is there anything you can share about where, where you're anticipating being able to build that infrastructure, particularly, particularly with respect to the generation of renewable energy? Certainly. 
uh, one of the th concrete things we can do to kind of mobilize those resources, we've heard from a, a number of years, Mr. Trudeau was talking about ending the fossil fuel subsidies. We would immediately end them. Instead of ending them, he increased them by about 900 million a year. That's a lot of capital, a lot of resources that could be directed towards infrastructure that's renewable. So some of the options, I think, uh, the geothermal, I think it's a very viable uh, and exciting opportunity to create jobs in Alberta, but also to remediate those oil wells. So geothermal energy there. Uh, we also were looking at the idea of an east-west energy grid. There are a lot of provinces like Manitoba, which have uh, an abundant supply of hydroelectric energy but they're not connected interprovincially. So there's a lot of energy being generated in Manitoba and in Quebec, but that energy doesn't make it to provinces that don't have that same resource like Saskatchewan or Alberta. So we would like to invest in, a, in an energy grid that goes east-west that connects that, that low cost, low carbon footprint energy with provinces that don't, they don't have that. That's another really bold, innovative way for us to create jobs, uh, create better access to energy. And as we move towards the electrification of vehicles, we know that all major car manufacturers have said they're going to end the sale of carbon or combustion engine vehicles in the soon, in the near future. Having more access to clean energy that's affordable will make that transition easier for workers and for people. Okay, Stephen, I'll try and get a couple more specifics for you, if you let me. I, I, I want to talk about the fossil fuel subsidies, because you, you bring that up uh, many times. The Liberals have promised to end fossil fuel subsidies by 2023. You said you will eliminate them immediately. You also talk about the fact that the Liberals have increased them. In fact, a lot of that money is now going to help those companies transition to greener technology. That's what they're using it for. They're also using it for cleaning up oils and gas wells. They're also using it for the pandemic wage subsidy. So it's not like all that money is going going to prop up oil and gas companies. Some of it is going to help them transition. So that's my question. You're going to end fossil fuel subsidies immediately. How do companies plan for that? What, what does that mean for the people who are still working for those companies right now? Uh, these are extremely profitable companies that have abandoned oil wells. Why would the federal government give money to those same companies that created the problem in the first place? That to me does not sound like a good solution. We would absolutely support the remediation, but why would we give money in subsidies to profitable companies that were the ones that created the problem in the first place? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, but do you not want to even give them money to help them transition to clean technology? But why would we give profit profitable companies money like that? These are companies that are making lots of profit. These are companies that are, that are on their own making profits. Why would we put our subsidies, put our taxpayer dollars towards an industry which is not the industry that we want to invest in. We want to invest in renewables. We want to invest in clean energy. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, and Mr. Trudeau has promised it because he knows it doesn't make sense. But the difference between him and I is that he promised to end them and has increased the investments to the level that he's yeah, at I, what Mr. Harper is investing. It, he's it, more than conservative. Except the reasons uh, that he increased it is the reasons I laid out there. Your ambitious targets, uh, your targets are more ambitious than the Liberals, 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, so that's more ambitious than the Liberals and the Conservatives. But it's not clear to me how you do it. How do you manage to get to that target? Uh, what, what is the plan? What's the, what's, the, what's the price on carbon? What's the cap? What, what, are, what are the specifics of that plan? Well, a couple of specifics. One of the things is that we've seen that the price on pollution is, is an effective tool, one of the tools, yep. but it can't be the only tool. And one of the big gaps in the current plan for the Liberals is they've exempted some of the biggest polluters. So those who emit the most are actually not having a price on their pollution. That's a problem. And there, there's a different, different program for, for the big emitters. So but what, it's effectively what, an exemption, and that exemption what, is what's causing, causing a lot of problems. What is your price on carbon then going forward, though? So our price is similar, but our approach is very different. Our approach is we wouldn't exempt the biggest polluters. We would make sure, make sure they were also included in the price on pollution. In addition, we believe, not unlike Mr. Trudeau and Mr. O'Toole, who think it's just about pricing pollution, we also think that government can play a role proactively in the investments we make. So our plan is very bold in the investments in renewable energy, electrifying, electrifying transportation, and retrofitting and renovating homes. We think that government can't just sit back and say, we'll put a price and hope the market sorts it out. We think we've got to be more proactive because this is uh, the fight of our lives. This well, is I, I, the, the Liberals are not just putting a price. They have a whole bunch of other measures to try and get industry to move into clean tech. The big difference is they're, they're incentive-based and, and kind of using market policies. We believe in using public resources and in investing in the clean energy and in investing in the renewable energies okay. and also the electrified transportation. Speaking of public resources, you criticize the Liberals for the, Trans Mountain, uh, the, the purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I have listened to you now for almost five weeks. I do not understand what you would do with it if you form government. So tell me. 
Well, I'm opposed to it. I've been opposed to it. I would have never bought it in the first yeah, place. I get that part. And what the I, second part I don't get. The second part is, you know, if Mr. Trudeau would have put as much energy in building pipelines as he would have in getting clean drinking water for indigenous okay, communities, but that, but that's, maybe but, we would have clean but drinking that, water. But that's not the question. The question is, you're the prime minister. The next day, what are you doing with the pipeline? Because it, it's, it's purchased, Canadians own it, and it's being expanded. What are you doing with it? Well, for Canadians to make it a good informed decision, they need to know where I stand. I'm opposed to it. I would have never bought it in the first place. Mr. Trudeau bought it and put us in this position. I would assess that asset and yeah. make the best decision for Canadians. What does that but mean? What does, what that, Canadians mean? Should what know does is, that mean, Mr. Singh? What Canadians should know is what, what I want to do. What does what that mean? What I want to do is put our money towards renewable yeah. energy. I, know, I believe the future sorry, has to be is, one yeah. where we're investing in what's renewable but, and yeah. what's sustainable. But that's this, what we should do. This is not a clear answer. And, and right now, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to give clear answers to the voters. You would it's assess, very clear. We have, to, we have to, in government, It's not, it's not clear. So you're going to assess it. And what is the determinant? What is the thing that you're going to look at to decide whether you keep it or sell it. What, What's what in the best the, interest for Canadians? What does that mean? Looking and assessing what is in yeah. their best interest. So if there's a loss of money, you would keep it. If there's a risk that Canadians would lose out financially, you would be okay with keeping it. I've made my position really clear on this. I'm opposed to it. I would have never purchased in the first place. Know, Mr. But that's, Trudeau but is the one who purchased I know, it. But, but it's done and now. And it's important it's for Canadians now. to know where I stand. It, yeah. And to know where I would, I would have never purchased it. We've got a Prime Minister who talks about fighting the climate crisis who turns around and buys a pipeline. That's something that Canadians can make a decision on. Inheriting a decision of Mr. Trudeau, I will look at that decision yeah. and make the best decision for Canadians. Okay, I, I, I'm going to leave it there. I, I, would, I would point out, though, that I don't think you answered that question. Welcome back. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh is here taking questions from undecided voters. Next up, watch this. My name is Laura Bode. I'm 43 years old and I live in Edmonton. I'm a single mom of two teenagers who are 15 and 16 years old. I'm a graphics design student and really looking forward to graduating at the end of the year and joining the workforce. I am an undecided voter because I see two parties that I want to vote for, yet want my vote to have as much sway as possible. As a disabled person, the rights and well-being of the disabled Canadians is always a big issue of concern for me. I'm really hoping to vote for a party that will look out for the well-being of my family and for all Canadians. Okay, before Laura, I give you your five minutes, just wanted to also acknowledge the people on Zoom who are watching and commenting and listening intently to Mr. Singh's answers too. But Laura, <laughs> your five minutes with Mr. Singh start now, over to you. Hello, Mr. Singh. Hi there. Thanks for having, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. Um, I'm a disabled Canadian, a student, and a single mother. If it weren't for the fact that my family has been heavily supporting me, I wouldn't be able to make ends meet. According to Statistics Canada, 22% of Canadians over the age of 15 are living with a disability. Of those, many are on or below the poverty level. What would you do if elected enabled, in order to enable Canadians with disabilities to live better lives? Thank you so much for your question. And uh, it takes a lot of courage to, to talk about uh, the challenges. And I want you to know that you speak for, for a lot of people that, that feel often ignored and neglected. Uh, one of the things that we've said in our platform and, and I'm committing to is that we would immediately implement uh, guaranteed income for people living with disabilities of $2,200 a month. Uh, just as a, as a starting point to lift people into a position of dignity so that people don't have to worry about making ends meet. And as you were shared with your personal story, can pursue education and training. Uh, but we really believe that's a, that's a starting point to provide people with that direct financial support. Thank you. My pleasure. Anything else, Laura? Would that be enough money for you, $2,200 a month? Um, it would make things difficult, but with other things included, it would help. Definitely. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to, I'll take a little bit more of your time and I'll come back to you and see if there's anything else. Because there's a couple other places where y y you've made promises uh, to people that, that would help, I think, all people, but maybe people with disabilities would be particularly interested. Pharmacare. Let's mm -hmm. start there. Mm -hmm. uh, you've said that you'll start a conversation with provinces to bring in a national pharmacare program. As you know, there are some provinces not interested in that. Mm -hmm. Quebec, even BC has said, we've, we've got our own deal, thanks. So how do you convince provinces that a national plan is needed? Uh, this is not unsimilar or uh, unlike what happened when we brought in universal health care. At the time, not every province agreed. 
And now it's something that Canadians are most proud of, the fact that we have universal health care. So it's not easy. I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. any way that it's easy, mm -hmm. but it makes sense. And the reason why it makes sense um, for people that are limited on their income, it would save a lot of money for families. Mr. Trudeau promised to do it. He thought it would be something important. We all believe in that. And he promised it in 2019. Two years later, he completely abandoned that promise. I wouldn't back down from yeah. it. I wouldn't give up on it. And what we would do differently is when we look at what would happen, this is a saving for provinces, this is a saving for companies, and this is a saving for people. What we would do is let's put together the buying power of all Canadians and negotiate better prices. Instead of having one province negotiate yeah. separately, we could all do it together and it would save money and it would make life better for people. Okay, I mean, you, you know that Mr... Seeing what, a, what, an arm being waist over, over here. Oh, okay, we'll get, we'll get there in just okay. a sec. Mr. Mr. Trudeau, as you know, says, I, I couldn't do it because of the pandemic. Like, things got busy for 18 months, and so I didn't, I didn't tack, get around to tackling it. I don't know if I buy that. I mean, okay. one, he promised it in 2019. It was a hallmark of his campaign, yeah. included in his throne speech. And the first time he could vote on something to actually move it forward, we brought forward a motion. Yeah. He teamed up with the Conservatives to vote against well, except it. Except it's your motion. There's politics involved. There's That's no why he's not... This, and in fact, the yeah. motion that we use, it's important for folks to know this, yeah. we actually included just the language of his own government commission report, know, which laid out you, you, a path you, But you know what that posturing the is only in politics. Way, they're not, oh, no, they're no, not no. going to support a motion uh, just no, no. because you put it forward. I don't want to accept that. If, if you believe in something in a minority okay. government and it's replicating exactly what his own government commission report had said, that this is the okay. way forward, and you team up with the Conservatives to vote against it, it's more than politics. Okay. You're stating a value. And Mr. Okay. Trudeau stated a value. Uh, he's against I'm going to go back to Laura, but just let me ask you, would you allow provinces to opt out? Quebec, for instance, has a plan. It's not going to want your plan. Would you just give them a pile of money and let them opt out? We've said that Quebec would, would have the right to opt out, but we know that this would be a plan if everyone opts in, would be better for everyone because okay. we could just combine our buying power and we would lower the price of medication in Quebec yeah. as well as across Canada. Laura, you had another follow-up. I love a follow-up from a voter. Go ahead. Not quite a follow-up, but my question is about health care. Yeah. Um, Alberta, there's a lot of rumors going around that Kenny is trying to privatize health care. What can Canada do and what would you do in order to ensure the protection of those of us, again, with disabilities who would probably not qualify. I think you're absolutely right. And not just you, a lot of people that are just on the margins, just barely making ends meet, they wouldn't be able to qualify for care if it was privatized. Uh, I am opposed to that firmly. And we've got some really good evidence about where the other parties stand. Uh, we would use the Canada Health Act to enforce the, the public delivery of care, but also when it came to the delivery of private for-profit care in long-term care homes, we put a motion saying that we should get rid of that profit in long-term care homes. And Mr. Trudeau and Mr. O'Toole voted to keep it private, to keep the profit and the greed in the system. We said it should not be there. Our public money is going to these long-term care centers. And if they're for-profit, some of that money is ending up in the pocket of shareholders. So we are opposed to private care firmly. The other parties aren't. And so if that's something that's important to you, you can count on us to defend public health care. Okay, Laura, that's great, because I had a follow-up on that uh, pledge as well, mm -hmm. to, to end private for-profit long-term mm -hmm. care. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, about 29% of all long-term care facilities in Canada are private and for-profit, the majority of them in Ontario. Exactly how would you put them into public ownership? Uh, how Would you go around and just buy them all up? and then they would fall into the jurisdiction of the provinces? Because you don't actually have that jurisdiction as a federal government. So what would, what would that look like? So it's not the ownership, it's the delivery of care that we're most fo focused on. Right now, when you've got a for-profit model of care, yeah. that means the care, some of that dollars that go towards care are going towards uh, profiting the investors or the, uh, the shareholders. What we're saying is the delivery of care cannot be for-profit. It has to be not-for-profit or public. And it's actually very similar to the same problem we had when we brought in universal health care. There were for-profit private hospitals. But we used the Canada Health Act yeah. to uh, effectively Yeah, but this doesn't fall under the Canada Health Act. This is a provincial jurisdiction. But so what would, do you do? We would include it into our Canada Health Act. So when we transfer money, why would a Canadian sit well with the idea that our public money is going into a company like Rivera that's uh, their shareholders are going to profit from Canadian dollars being invested in long-term care. Yep. That doesn't make any sense. I want to see every single cent that we invest in long-term okay. care okay, going that, to our seniors, going that, to our loved ones. But that's a big thing. Now you, now you have to get the provinces sitting at the table and you've got to crack open the Canada Health Act and restructure it so that you suddenly have control of long-term care. That's basically what you're saying. Not control, but when we're funding, yeah. we don't want any of our funds to go into private care. 
So we right. can make sure that happens. And it's not that it's easy to do, it's hard, but it was hard to bring in universal health care as well. There are lots of people saying but, you can't yeah. do it, it's yeah. impossible. We have it now. But, but, Similarly, but, but you would have to create the mechanism to do it. You, yeah, yeah, there's lots of ways, though. There's okay. lots of ways that are out there. We could have a standalone piece of legislation that talks about long-term care and that federal transfers have to yeah. go for only for not-profit uh, yeah. delivery. But and that's something we need to do. But provinces don't even want national standards for long-term care. They, they don't want you in their business. So here's another example, Pharmacare, this, where you're just assuming that you're going to be able to convince provinces and territories that to go along with it. Oh, I'm confident we can assume, pe we can, uh, can wow. convince people. The reason <laughs> Have is- Have you met the Premier, sir? <laughs> it's not about the Premiers, it's about people. And yes, people but, who lost but, their loved yeah. ones. But let me finish this idea. Yeah. Yes. People who lost their loved ones in long-term care, they lost their loved ones to horrible conditions where they were neglected, not fed right, not fed appropriately, not given water, yeah. not treated well, because of for-profit care, and that's clear. How would I stand by and let that happen? I'm going to find a way yeah, but to it's find not, a solution. But it is not your job. It is the Premier's job That's the difference between me and a, See, the difference between me and maybe Mr. Trudeau, Mr. O'Toole, Mr. Trudeau, is that they can maybe live with being like, oh, it's not my job. I think it's my it's, job. It's if not I'm that it's not their job. It's literally not their jurisdiction. No, I disagree. If that but you was have to change the law to make it your if jurisdiction. If that was our approach, though, Ms. Barton, then we would not have universal health care. Because if, if, premiers, if prime ministers at the time thought, oh, it's not my job to deal with health care, we would literally not have universal yeah, health care because it started at the federal level. Yes, but there is a division of power. And what you're saying, you're going to go to provinces and say, you're not doing it right, so I'm going to do it? No, no. The difference is I'm going to go to a loved one who's lost their, their mom or their dad yeah, but and say to yeah. them, okay. I'm going to fight for you. Okay. I'm going to fight to make sure that this never happens again. Okay. I'm not going to hide behind jurisdiction. That's the difference between me and Mr. Mr. Trudeau, who would love to just hide behind jurisdiction. I don't, think, I don't believe I don't, that's I don't appropriate. Know if you, I don't know if hiding behind jurisdiction so much as respecting the boundaries of what you're allowed to do. I respect that loved ones were killed yeah. in this pandemic because of for-profit care okay. and I want to save their lives. Laura, anything else from you before I move on? No, thank you very much. When we come back, more face-to-face -face with Jagmeet Singh. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Rosemary Barton and this is Face to Face with Jagmeet Singh. Let's get to our next question. Hi, I'm Ethan Chen. I'm a first-time undecided voter. I come from second-generation Chinese-Canadian immigrant roots, and I'm currently a student at Western University where I study international relations and business, and I'm interested in university debating and student advocacy. The pandemic has hit young people particularly hard, with growing unaffordability, the negative impacts of climate change making it hard to plan out our life. I want to understand how political leaders are going to support young people and help make our lives better for the future. All right, first time voter, Ethan. This is this is great. Let's hear. Uh, this is this is will really help you. Hopefully, here's Mr. Singh for you now. Thanks, Rosemary, and thank you, Mr. Singh, for being on the program. My pleasure. Um, I'm Ethan. I'm a first time undecided voter, and um, I'm concerned about the cost of living because where I'm from in Richmond Hill, the average cost of a home has gone up to around a million dollars. And mm. for someone who's about to graduate from university, it's hard to be optimistic because uh, so many opportunities and jobs are in places that are too unaffordable to thrive in. So I wanna know what you will do to support young people in reducing the cost of living, especially in urban areas. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. And I didn't wanna bias you, but I also went to Western so uh, we have that in common. <laughs> uh, but don't use That's that, to, don't let that bias you. Um, so, uh, so, so first of all, I, I hear you. I mean, I speak, I've spoken with lots and lots of young people. And while you should be optimistic and hopeful, and I want you to keep that hope alive, I know it's very tough to do that when the cost of tuition is so high, people are graduating with high student debt, and then the prospect of trying to buy a home seems just out of imagina imagination. And, and that to me is really wrong. So there's a couple things we can do. Uh, in terms of bringing down the cost of living, there's a lot of costs that we have a uh, direct control over. We pay some of the highest fees in the world for our cell phone and internet. And these fees are, they can add up and make it really difficult. So we wanna put a cap on how much cell phone companies can charge you. A price cap has been put in place in the United States and in Australia to lower the cost. We also wanna make sure that those data plans, when they say they're unlimited and they're not really unlimited because as soon as you go over the limit, they slow them down, we want to mandate that they have to be truly unlimited. That's a, a significant savings. Our plan for pharmacare and dental care would save a lot of money for families, but specifically for housing, which is what you, you mentioned, which is something that I, I, I care deeply about, we've seen how much it's increased. From 2015 to present, the national average cost of housing has gone up by $300,000 in the past six years. So things have gotten a lot worse. 
and we're performing worse than every other country in the OECD when it comes to affordability and buying a home. So what we want to do is two things. Take the big money out of housing. We're seeing lots of folks use the housing market like a stock market, property flipping and driving up the cost of homes. We see a lot of foreign investment that's driving up the cost of homes. We want to get that big money out. And we also want to build more homes that are within people's budget. That, that's not-for-profit housing, cooperative housing, for purpose-built rental housing, as well as homes that are in your budget to purchase. We want to help people buy their first home. And if people want to rent, we want to make it really affordable so it's not taking up half of your salary for people that want to try to live in a new city. This is something we can tackle, but it means having the courage to do it. And, and this is something I really care about. A follow-up, Ethan? Thanks. Um, that's yeah, um, just on the topic of building housing, I'm just wondering, because I think a lot of people agree that we do want more housing and having more cooperatives and affordable housing is great. I'm just wondering like, how you would do that with working with municipalities and provinces, because from what I understand, they're responsible for building them. So I'm wondering how you would work with them to build the homes. Well, you're, you're bang on. You've done your civics course as well. It's absolutely <laughs> uh, municipal and, and provincial levels of government that do the actual building. But the CMHC, the, the federal government's um, department that deals with housing, used to really aggressively fund the building of homes. And that's kind of tapered off around the 90s. And we've seen in communities, there hasn't been a lot of new cooperatives or, or uh, affordable homes built since the 90s. And that's been because the federal government hasn't really played a strong role. I want to change that. I want to see a really proactive role working directly with municipalities, working with provinces, using federal land. There's a lot of federal land in cities around Canada that could be used for purposely for uh, affordable homes. There's one project that we stopped uh, in Toronto where there was a parking lot owned by the federal government that was going to be sold for condominiums. And we said, no, that shouldn't be used for uh, expensive condominiums. It should be built for, for students or should be built for people who need to find something that's affordable. And we were able to push back against the federal government and get that decision changed. That's the type of thing we want to see happen, using every resource we have, federal land and federal resources, to build those affordable homes. Okay, Ethan, I'm going to ask a couple of follow-up, if that's okay. Um, I, I want to ask you a little bit about taxing the wealthy. Y you say that this uh, new revenue will allow you to pay for your more than $200 billion worth of promises over mm -hmm. five years. The Parliamentary Budget Officer, though, w when examining this previously for you, has said, quote, a large behavioural response should be expected. In other words, rich people aren't, aren't going to let you come for their money. <laughs> they're going to move. They're going to decide to do something different. So why do you think it will work when you've been warned that it might not? You know, that really speaks to who I am as a person. Just because people tell me that it's hard to do something, I don't back down from it. Uh, Mr. Trudeau has recently been really, you know, it's been out there that he said you can't tax the super wealthy with unlimited zeal. I disagree. I want maximum zeal in taxing the super wealthy. I know that we can do this. Yeah. And yeah. one proof point recently, yeah. Mr. Biden actually, Mr. President Biden has just put out a plan. And if you look at his plan, it's very similar to ours. It includes the same capital gains inclusion increases. It includes a tax on the extremely wealthy. Yeah. And it, claims a lot, it includes a lot of the similar proposals. If Mr. Biden is proposing the exact same thing that we put out in our campaign months and months ago, um, it shows that there are other people out there that think this is achievable. And just because it's hard for me is never a barrier. I'm yeah, going to keep uh, on doing okay, it. Okay, but, but I mean, it, you, need to, you need to get the money in order to pay for the very expensive and ambitious programs you've laid out here. In France, they actually stopped collecting, collecting the wealth tax in 2019. And it was because rich people decided, I would rather just not be a resident of France and keep my money. So what, what do you do to make sure that you can keep the rich people in the country in order to get that money? Because otherwise your plan starts to fall apart. Well, we've got a lot of different plans. And, and I'm confident what we're proposing is just about fairness. We're saying that the super wealthy have gotten away with not paying their fair share. Yeah. And it used to not be that way. Not too long ago, the ultra wealthy actually paid their fair share. And conservatives and liberals have been eroding that that, the, the, that liberals, level the liberals of taxation. have raised the taxes on the 1% of the country. Now, the Mr. 1% inside Canada makes up 26% of the wealth in this country. Now, Mr. That's Trudeau a said pretty that. Pretty big deal. Mr. Trudeau said that, but yeah. has he closed the offshore tax havens? Has he closed the corporate loopholes? Has he made companies like Amazon that make record profits in this pandemic pay anything in Canada? No. And the, that's the problem. The he hasn't done what it really takes. The Zoom audience wants you to define who the ultra-rich are. How much yeah. money are we talking about? We're talking about the 44 billionaires in Canada that earned $78 billion 
plus during the pandemic. We're talking about fortunes of over 10 million that will tax 1% on everything above 10 million. So someone's got $20 million in fortune, yeah. we'd put a 1% tax on the fortune of, of 10 million of okay, that. So it's probably no one on the Zoom call and not me either. Let's ask a couple more <laughs> exactly. questions. That's what I should have said. You, you, no, <laughs> it's my, no one, one on the Zoom call. Like, you know, are you going after the folks with a two car garage and a Peloton? I'm like, no, that's no. not you. You're right, I'm talking right. about the super. Okay. You ruled out uh, in, in February, you were quoted in the Star as saying, I don't see any alignment with Conservatives. Is that still the case? I don't. I mean, in terms of our values and their values, they don't align. I think that Mr. O'Toole would make a bad pre Prime Minister for Canadians. I also think that we can't afford another more four years of Mr. Uh, Trudeau as Prime Minister. It costs Canadians yeah. too much. Except y y you say, and you even said again uh, earlier this morning, they are both bad. They are both bad. But isn't one of them easier for you to get things out of than the other? You're not getting a national pharmacare plan for Mr. O'Toole. You know you're not. You're not getting a dental care. You're not getting any of that. What sway do you have with a conservative leader who's not interested in the same values as you? You've just said it. Well, I mean, I actually put forward a pharmacare plan and Mr. Trudeau rejected it. So does it sound like I've got much chance with the liberals getting pharmacare either? Well, you, you at least know that your values align. Well, I know that he'll say the right things. But for people, it costs them when he doesn't do the right things. And that's really what it comes down to. And I think the best way to get any of these things to happen is to vote for more, more new Democrats. That's fine, but it, it looks like we're headed towards a minority government. You will have to use whatever power you have in terms of the seats you win. Do you think that you could manage to sway Mr. O'Toole to do some of the things you want to do? Uh, I know that the more we have, the more Canadians vote for new Democrats, the better position we have, we'll have to get the things that people need whether it's pharmacare, getting profit out of long-term care, fighting the climate crisis, helping people with disabilities, supporting small businesses. If these are things that people want, New Democrats have a clear plan to achieve it. And yeah, the except, best way to get it done is to vote for New Democrats. Well, except you're probably not going to form government. And if a progressive voter who cares about the things that you've just said there wants to make sure they get them, uh, wh why would they vote for you? Because they'll more likely get them if, I'm, if there's more New Democrats elected. In this pandemic, people got more help because we were there. Yeah. We were able to increase the supports to people. If people want more help, more do Democrats will make it happen. Yeah. We've seen Mr. Tr Trudeau team up with Mr. O'Toole, voting against taxing the ultra-rich, voting against pharmacare, voting against getting profit and greed out of long-term care. You, yeah. So we know where he stands on yeah. those things. More of us will help people, and okay. that's what we're putting okay. to you, 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 when In the previous election, you said, I'm not working with Andrew Scheer. I, I don't support his values and the things that he has expressed. Do you say the same thing about Mr. O'Toole or no? You're more open to working with him. Well, you know, it's an interesting question. Yes. You know, uh, I look at all the leaders right now that are running for prime minister. There is only one leader who's actually ever propped up a conservative government, and that's Mr. Trudeau. In 20, uh, 2009, when he was a member of parliament, he is the only leader who actually voted in favor of the Harper conservative budget to prop up the government. Well, so there, was, really, there, was a, there, was more, a, there was a worldwide recession we're, happening, we're more likely right? To see, so, but so, we're more likely to see Mr. Trudeau work with conservatives yeah, there, than we are to see Yeah, there's uh, a lot Democrats of context you're leaving out here Canadians. about about the world melting down financially. But but, but my, that's the facts. The facts my, of the matter is we okay. voted against but it. My Mr. Question, Trudeau voted my, for My the question, though, remains. Are you open to working with Mr. O'Toole? I think that's something Canadians need to know. They need to know that I, I think both Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Trudeau are going to be bad for Canadians in the sense they're going to cost them more. And I don't want people to be scared. I just think that they're going to cost them more. You have promised $200 billion in promises. Aren't they're you going to cost, cost them more? <laughs> well, I'm going to save people. I'm going to cost the billionaires more for sure. And if you're a billionaire out there, not you, Rosie, not the folks yeah. that we're listening to, but billionaires out there, yes, I'm going to cost you more. Don't be, don't be <laughs> alarmed. You're going, to call, you're going to pay a bit more. But for everyday Canadians, they're going to save money. They're going to save money on pharmacare. They're going to save money on their medication. But only if their you dental become care. prime minister. Well, that's why people got to vote for me. I'll end it on this. You think, do you think there's a problem with being too ambitious? $200 billion in new spending over five years is a lot of money. The promises that you have are huge. I know you say that this is the kind of person you are. You, 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 you can take on big things. You want to work hard. Mm -hmm. I get that. But there are probably people who feel that this is not achievable, that this is not realistic, that these are not things that can be done in time. Is that hampering people's ability to vote for you? I think they are achievable. And we've laid out we're the only party with a clear plan. You know, when we hear Mr. Trudeau and Mr. O'Toole talk about either tax credits or investments, they haven't laid out a really uh, significant revenue plan. 
So they're either going to do to one of two things. Well, and it's not they, I would say they both have, frankly. Not and they really. put out their they're costing both, ahead of you. They're either going to cut yeah. help to people, and Mr. Trudeau's already started. He's cut the, C, the CRE. He's already started. Mr. O'Toole, well, we're certainly going to cut help to people. We've said we're not going to cut the help that people need. And we're not so going to leave the pandemic back on them. supports in place for how long? We've talked about what we would yeah. do. We would put in place for uh, for small business like uh, yeah. like Nulifers. We would yeah. increase. We would continue with those programs, the wage subsidy and the uh, uh, rental subsidy. But what we would do differently is yeah. make sure that the super large corporations are starting to pay their fair share to invest in people. So we've got the only plan that doesn't require cutting help to people or putting the burden on them. We see their burden should fall on the multi-millionaires and billionaires, and we've got a clear plan to do it. If you're the official opposition uh, af after this election, um, how do you get the things that you're talking about? How do you, how do you make that happen? How do you, how, what is the conversation going to be? We're not gonna concede the election, so I'll say that in whatever uh, parliament Canadians choose, we're gonna fight for them. And they can know where I stand on the important things. They know where I stand on taxing the super rich, they know where I stand on healthcare, on the environment, yeah on supporting small businesses. I want you to know I'll be there for you. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. That is it for tonight's Face to Face with the federal leaders. Thank you to our questioners. I'm sure Mr. Singh says thanks. Yeah, yeah. he's happy too. Wonderful questions. Thanks Thank to you. our great virtual audience who also listened intently. And of course, to the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. Uh, less than a week away, tomorrow, we will have Green Party leader Annamie Paul in, uh, in the studio to answer some of your questions. If you, if you miss any of tonight, you want to catch up on any of our sit-downs with Mr. O'Toole or Mr. Trudeau, the full conversations are posted on CBC Gem. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thanks again, and I'll see you back here tomorrow night.